so you know when we talk about we were talking about nature and nurture and we were talking about heritability right um so you have a diagram here which shows you that you know the researchers disagree over how much heritability um how much of intelligence is heritable or is influenced by genes and you have those who advocate for a more high estimate be, and you know they basically say that 80% of your intelligence is determined by your genes whereas 20% is determined by the environment and you know you have a low estimate which is 40% is determined by the genetics and 60% is determined by the environment uh more recent consensus on this is more of a 50-50 that you know um environment and genetics play an equally important role um in determining intelligence you have other theories as well that explain this one of right so one of these is uh, what is called the reaction range um the reaction range what that means is that you know you might have what genetics might endow you with is a particular range right uh in which your iq may fall but it's your environment which determines where exactly you fall within that range right so basically you know here what you see is that you know when you look at tom right so his his reaction range or the range that his genetics sort of uh gave him was anywhere from between let's say here you have something like 60 65 right and here at the other extreme you had 84 right now because of genetics he had this range that he could fall within right it was the environment that, that decided where he would fall if he had if he didn't have an enriched environment he might have fallen somewhere here right but because he had an enriched environment he fell at the extreme level right of his reaction range and he made the most of you know whatever genetics had given him and he he has an iq of 84 whereas when you consider kimberly here her reaction range was something like you know it starts from below 100 let's say something like 95 right and her reaction range went on till something like 120 right and her, because her environment was also enriched her iq stands at 117 right if you consider the people who are more deprived here right so reaction range for alice here right was you know because of her um genetic endowment she was anywhere between 120 to 150 right but because her environment was deprived she stood at 125 right had her environment been enriched she would perhaps have fallen here right somewhere closer to 140 right so this is the idea of the reaction range which uh, incorporates both nature and nurture rather than just sort of you know focusing on either one of these right so yeah so and you know there can be other determinants as well so it's not just genetics um social economic disadvantage children who are born into more poor families um will not perhaps have as much of um will not score as high on an IQ test as you know fam as children who belong to families that are better off one of the reasons might of that might be that you know they're not exposed to the same level of education they're not exposed to the same level of book you know they they're not exposed to books in the same manner um adults might not talk to them in the same manner they're not given the same sort of attention because parents are perhaps busy in um trying to earn so much for them that they can feed them so all of these different factors come in obviously uh the sort of school that you go to can have you know sort of can play a role in enriching your environment or depriving it right so you know school also plays an extremely important part and you cannot leave that out so all of these different um you know aspects can play a part in determining your intelligence now we talk about this other area within intelligence which is basically you know the extremes of intelligence and here what you have is you know on the extremes of intelligence you have here what we call retardation 
and here you have what you call giftedness right so you know when we talk about retardation what exactly is retardation how would you define retardation so retardation is below level intelligence right it's basically um let me show you this diagram here so you have this table here so retardation is not just it's not just sub average you know general mental ability but you know that's not the only way that you would define retardation that it's um below average mental ability general mental ability but that it's also accompanied by right so it's below general below average general mental ability but there are also deficiencies in adaptive skills what does that mean so basically these adaptive skills can take on you know they belong to different domains so they can be something like self care that these can these individuals you know take care of themselves can they give themselves a bath can they tie their own shoelaces um can they interact socially so social interaction can they understand what a person is trying to demand out of them right um they can come in the form of community life can they go shopping can they understand that you know if they pay someone um 20 rupees and they buy something for 10 rupees they need to ask for those 10 rupees back can they for example um recognize illness right can they you know home skills can they cook themselves a meal right so all of these different adaptive skills you look at you know deficiencies in adaptive skills as well in addition to looking at um you know below average general mental ability now here you have these categories of retardation so here you have what is termed mild retardation right and this is basically you know um this is the iq range you can complete 6th grade let's say if you have mild retardation you can be self supporting in nearly normal fashion if your environment obviously is supportive then you know if you have moderate retardation again you can be semi independent but you need help with mild stress um if your retardation is severe you can um you know you can only self support under total supervision you again have limited speech toilet habits and so forth if your retardation is profound you know there's again little or no speech and you require total care right and your iq range here is below 20 now this is one sort of um you know one extreme of intelligence the other extreme of intelligence is something that we call giftedness now when we talk about gifted individuals a lot of stereotypes exist about gifted individuals you might have seen these in movies that you know these individuals are extremely you know what what we call nerdy in the sense that they perhaps do not have a lot of friends so they you know isolated from society right that you know they are a particular build in the sense that they're not very athletic um they're mostly skinny or they're not you know physically um as fit as other individuals right so there's a physical sort of um stereotype that goes with it what you see however when you do research what you see is that mostly gifted individuals right they defy all of these stereotypes so they are the ones you know who score high on intelligence and they're the ones who have um a variety of meaningful relationships a variety of meaningful friendships you know so they are popular in their school or university they are you know physically more athletic right they are taller let's say than average right so you know these stereotypes when you look at um when you do research and you actually look at individuals who are gifted what you do find is that these stereotypes are negated right uh, there are different views about it so certain researchers will say something like 
if, for example, you're looking at IQ ranges between, and this is a this is a high IQ range, this is where you will get examples of these individuals who are, you know, um, very intelligent, who are socially very adept, right? Um, who are very athletic and physically well built. Right, but once you cross the 150 mark, right, once you cross this mark and you look at 150 onwards, so you know, even 180 onwards, one of the things that you'll see is that this is where you get these sort of stereotypes in which these people have something like negative emotionality, right, and they are socially more isolated. So there are these different views about it. However, you know, when you talk about giftedness, only having high intelligence is not enough for someone to gain what we term eminence, right? So for eminence, you know, eminence is basically when you reach a particular level of, you know, being well known as a master of a particular field. So eminence is not really um, a product of giftedness alone. Um, in order to achieve eminence, you need not just giftedness, or you do not just need um, you know, a high degree of mental um, ability, but you also need a lot of hard work. You also need a lot of motivation, right? In order to find eminence in anything that you're doing in life, right? So yes, yeah, so you know, this is some discussion about the extremes of intelligence. Next, what we come to is this new way of looking at intelligence that was that was proposed by psychologist Howard Gardner. And Gardner basically, you know, put forth this view that rethinks our way of looking at intelligence as being just this general mental ability. And he talks about intelligence is actually can be divided into these eight different forms of intelligences, right? And one person may have one, may have two, may have three even, but it's not necessary that everyone has all forms of intelligence, right? So here what we see is that the first sort of intelligence that we consider is something that we call the logical mathematical intelligence, right? And this is someone who's well suited to be a scientist or a mathematician. This sort of person has sensitivity and capacity to discern, you know, logical or numerical patterns, ability to handle long chains of reasoning, right? So basically, this is someone who is extremely good with numbers, who can recognize different patterns between numbers, who can handle, you know, all of these long chains of reasoning, right? Um, linguistic intelligence is... Um, you know, someone who is a poet or a journalist would have linguistic intelligence and you have sensitivity to sounds and the meanings of words. You have sensitivity to the different functions of language. So you can basically use language in a way which is extremely powerful, right? So, you know, that would make for a successful poet or journalist. Then there is something that Gardner calls musical intelligence, that you have the ability to produce and appreciate rhythm and all of these other components of, of sound, right? You have appreciation to all the forms of musical expressiveness. Someone like this is best suited to becoming something like a composer, a violinist, you know, a guitarist perhaps, a pianist even. Then you have something called spatial intelligence. This is basically, you know, the capacity to perceive the spatial world accurately and um, the ability that you know you can you know you can imagine something imagine a particular shape and you can rotate it you know to all of these different angles inside your head right so someone who's a navigator or a, or a sculptor would have a lot of spatial intelligence then you have bodily kinesthetic intelligence and this is basically that you have the ability to control one's body movement so someone who is very clumsy does not have a lot of bodily kinesthetic intelligence then you have something called interpersonal intelligence, which is you have the capacity to discern and respond appropriately to other people's words, their moods, their motivations, right? This is someone who might be a, a good therapist that they can recognize all of these different emotions in other people, 
even a salesperson because a salesperson needs to be able to discern you know what you're looking for so someone who has interpersonal intelligence who can recognize um, other people's moods temperaments motivations right would be a good therapist a good salesperson then you have interpersonal intelligence which is basically knowledge of one's own self one's own feelings right the ability to discriminate amongst one's own feelings so this is someone who has a lot of you know detailed accurate self knowledge even you know to be a therapist i think this is also required that you recognize your own feelings successfully naturalist right someone who has the ability to recognize and categorize objects and processes in nature again you know a biologist or a naturalist is would have a high degree of naturalist intelligence so yes with this we conclude our discussion of this chapter and yes thank you for listening